Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 28, 2022, and this is the week in charts. I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. Every week I say I'm going to do a better job promoting the show, and I don't. <laughs> so, sorry I make it so hard to find. If you're watching this on YouTube and you want to participate live, DaveLearner.com slash webinar. Register you. The link is old, and you'll have access to all the upcoming shows. So what are we talking about? Well, let's, we're going to talk about current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. When we get to the live charts, your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides. And once we get to the live charts, you can ask about anything. And we could always go back to the slides. Two, your stock, your favorite stock picks and crypto is not a whole lot of crypto to look at, but we will take a look at crypto. So what are we going to focus on? Well, I did a trading ogre example for stockcharts.com. So I want to follow up on that and I want to show you what I did there. I also want to talk a little bit about the VIX and it's something that I, I sort of found by accident again and I think it's worth mentioning and then the holy grail of intraday trading and that'll make sense in a little while it's based on a Facebook post I put out recently that was a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I like to sum it up all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's talk about trading opening gap reversals. And what I try to do is every time I have a live example, I like to show in these presentations. And the reason being that I probably get more questions about that than anything else. And it's a little bit outside of the methodology, but if you think about it, it's sort of you're, you're using a setup to begin with, and the opening gap is just a way to, to get in that setup for an intraday trade. So here's NEX. It is a thick oil related company or energy related company. And you can see it was at a really, really nice uptrend followed by a pullback. And then notice that it gapped open. This was on Monday, I believe. Now, if we take a look at it intraday, it gapped and then immediately began to rally. And this was kind of a tough one. It created a go or no go situation. And in a situation like that, you really want to be careful. And I could have easily gotten sucked into the stock. I'm going to show you what I did in one minute that, that helped a little bit. And luckily, I didn't. Anyway, it then began to implode. Now, once they do this, not that you won't still lose money, but it's that first few minutes of trading where you could really get sucked in to a bad trade it'll it'll rally just enough to bring you in and then it will reverse on you so i was feeling a oh goodness thank goodness i didn't jump in on that because that rally looked a lot bigger than it really was and then you can see it kind of meandered and kind of based out for a while so in a case like this instead of waiting for it to get all the way back to the old high for the day which by the way is nothing wrong with that okay but sometimes you get a little bit of a head start on these if you wait for like an intraday breakout. What do you see it based now for a while? So it based out for a, almost the entire morning and then it began to take off with a little bit of vigor. So on that breakout, I bought a thousand shares and I did it across more than one account. So, but I like to show just like a model type account for these type of trades. Anyway, stop was down here, half a point risk which gave us a half a point risk, or excuse me, a half a point IPT up here. Remember the goal is to hit the initial profit target and then trail a stop higher and hopefully be with the trend for a long, long time, at least until the end of the day. So let's take a look at what happened. So again, we trail the stop higher as it moves in our favor. Now I noticed that or you might notice that I was looking for a much, a little bit higher IPT. When it hit like 10, 15 or whatever it was, I was thinking, geez, you know, this thing's close enough for government work. I better get out of it. And by the time I got in, got to, was able to get out of it, it had backed off a little bit and I got out at 10.08, which is better than a poke in the eye. And I'll check my other account to see if I, did, I got a little better on this. This, this account here is still browser-based and it's kind of clunky and slow which is actually in some cases good for me. It stops me from the hitting the button like the uh, rat going for the cocaine. 
and you can see this is how it shook out the rest of the day. And then I ended up exiting on the close, probably right about where I got out on the uh, initial profit target. So I was looking for like 10, 17, 10, 18. I got 10, 08, better than poking the eye, right? And if you add all this up, it comes to 391, which isn't the most impressive trade in the world. But keep in mind, this is an ancillary trade. And, and I know it's hypothetical and if, and also kind of a big wish. <laughs> But if I could pick up an extra one of these every day, even if it's just one at $400, that's an extra 100K a year. So I know it's a little bit uh, fuzzy math. But on the flip side, if you lose $400 on a trade like this, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to keep risking $400 because if you risk $400 a day and lose $400 a day, that's, that's still 100 grand a year. But in a case like this, I felt like the odds were in my favor and I felt that it was worth a shot. By the way, I try not to show anything here in case you're newer to my YouTube channel or my website, but I try to not show anything here that I haven't at least mentioned first publicly, either through a trading service or the Facebook group. So I did talk about this particular setup in Facebook as a potential ogre. So one way to help avoid getting triggered in too early if you're watching that intraday chart and uh, flickering ticks, as Todd Harrison calls them, and you're kind of getting sucked in like a moth, well, that that 15 minute bar where it begins a rally is going to look about that big, but sometimes it might just be a little bit of a blip on the daily chart. So that's one thing that you might want to do is pop out to the daily, take a look at the daily to make sure you're not getting sucked in on potential noise. No, alone now. I'm going to repeat it because I'm going to get asked this if I don't say it. You can't just, you know, why not wait for the first 15 minutes? Well, in this case, it would have worked swimmingly, right? It would have been fantastic to do that. However, sometimes they just take off and they go and go and go and go and go. And those people who are waiting those 15 minutes are forced to get in at higher and higher and higher and higher levels. And sometimes that helps to really propel the stock higher. So you can't just say, I'm going to wait 15 minutes. I, I had a salad earlier, but it was salty. It's killing me. Anyway, so there's the opening gap reversal. And in a case like this, rallies up a little bit, comes back in. Then you can say, aha, maybe it faked out everyone. And maybe later in the day, this thing might make the mother of all reversals. By the way, I remember one that I nearly missed. I think I had an order in. I forgot about it. And I forget when this was. It was probably about two years ago. Completely forgot about it. Had a stop entry order in place. And I was doing my IPO analysis, whatever I do at the end of the day. And all of a sudden, I heard a zing. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And I went over and checked the trading station. And I had triggered into an ogre. And the last 15 minutes was a bit of a route higher. So don't forget about these things if they don't trigger right away. In fact, if you go, we go back one slide, you'll see that I could have easily forgotten about it because right around lunchtime is when it triggered. I could have said, oh, let's go eat some lunch, Big Dave, and totally missed it. So anyway, sometimes you get a late day trigger. All right, any questions on that? Now, picking the best ogres, we've been through this a hundred times. So let me just kind of skim over it. I have other videos on YouTube, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry. If you want to check out those videos, check out the quick clips first, because I've parsed out a lot of this stuff there. And then if you really want to learn about all this stuff, obviously become a gold member at least and go on the back end of the website. It's all laid out for you there. Anyway, larger cap, ideally well-known issues work the best. Now, I never heard of that NEX, but the volume was about 3.6 million on average daily. So it had a lot of, of players, so to speak. But usually name brand stocks, especially if they're really trending and then they set up and then they ogre, can work out really well. But you need a lot of players because maybe the ogre just shook out in a thin stock, that is, most all of the players that were there and nobody wants to come in and buy it. So those players might be institutions that missed the boats who might be getting, looking to get in a little bit more cheaply. And by the way, 
years ago when we traded ogres on the NYSE stocks, the uh, the reasoning there was that the market maker, and this is still in effect to some extent, I guess, with the online market makers. But let's say a company gets torpedoed overnight and it's at a gap down five points. Well, they open on that, the market makers actually have to buy that stock. Now, there's some arguments on whether or not they sit on their hands and what they do. But for argument's sake, let's assume they have to be a market maker and buy the stock. Well, they're going to they're gonna bring that stock down as low as they can to, to buy that stock from you. And it's kind of a hot potato with them. They don't want to hold on that stock all day long. They want to flip it out as quickly as possible and get a profit off of that stock. So that's one reason the ogres can, and can be in a keyword in that sentence, but they can work out pretty nicely, is because you're trading on the side of the market maker and he likes to feed his family. Now, institutions may have missed the boat on it. And they may be getting looking to get in a little bit more cheaply. So especially if it's a name brand stock, really thick, and they feel like they they need to own the stock so they can kind of window dress, so to speak, or whatever the case may be. So they might come in on that gap and see it as a liquidity event to buy those shares that they need. There might be some sort of desk traders or something that that failed to meet the VWAP, volume weighted average price. I think that's what that means. And they have to go in and buy that stock as cheaply as possible. So that might help. Uh, there might be some individual traders, obviously, that may have been knocked out. And uh, through emotions or emotionally, they might feel like they need to get back in the stock. And then you could have some, let's say, some lucky shorts who shorted it at the top because shorts tend to be very egotistical. They like to sell things that are at high levels. And sometimes they sell things at extremely high levels. Like I've said, ad nauseum, I didn't know it was a strategy of the shorts, but they actually short the parabolics. And that stocks that are going straight up, they actually short those. Crazy, crazy, crazy thing to do. Don't try that at home. I would never do that. Although I've been tempted before, but it's such a dangerous way to trade. But anyway, let's say the lucky shorts did short it at high levels, it has a big gap down, they're feeling vindicated. Well, that thing begins to rally, and all of a sudden they think, you know what? I better I better not look this gift horse in the mouth. I better take those profits. And you might have had some new shorts come in and say, aha, I knew this thing would crack. Damn it, I missed the top. So they short it on the gap. And sometimes you get a gap and go situation. And I've been known to take a, an S and G trade here and there when that occurs. You just got to be really careful when you do that. But the real money and the real setup is in the opening gap reversal. So if those shorts piled in on the open, then all of a sudden, if you get a big reversal, they might be getting squeezed out quickly. Always think about the psychology of what's happening. All these little patterns aren't magical. There is a conceptually correct reasoning behind them. Now, the stock should be set up with strong momentum and recently has hit new highs. I see you guys in Facebook every now and then talk about an opening gap reversal, stock that's gapping down to 52-week lows. That's not the type of opening gap reversal I want to play. That's what I call a burning dog. And that's something that uh, I borrowed from Lindy Re Linda Rasky's book. I think it's out of reach, Trading Sardines, which I would recommend you read. And it is right there. So make sure it's set up. Don't trade stocks that are in downtrends with this pattern. All right. Any questions on opening gap reversals? I know I think everybody here is in the Facebook group, so you're probably up to speed on that. All right. Every time the market gets a little volatile, as it has been lately, I tend to dust off the VIX and start playing around with the VIX a little bit. So a little background on the VIX. It's a measurement of volatility of at the money puts and calls 30 days out. And it's a hypothetical calculation. But the point I want to make here is that it is puts and it is calls. And people tend to 
forget that that calls are also are also parts of the equation. And I guess it's I guess it probably doesn't make probably doesn't make that big of a difference if you think about it, you option guys, because you'd have put call parity anyway at, at the money, right? So maybe that just cancels out. But it is puts and is calls, and that's something that people I think don't realize. And again, it's it's a hypothetical 30 day at the money option. And that's about all I know about it, other than how to use it. The formula is actually pretty simple. There it is right there. Just uh <laughs> obviously I'm kidding. But that is the formula. I got that from CBOE.com or CBOT.com. One of those guys. Now, what you really need to know is this. It can be a fear index. And markets do tend to bottom on extreme fear. And markets tend to top on complacency. One thing it's good for is it's a good measure, or one measure, I should say, of overbought and oversold. Just remember that just because something is oversold doesn't mean it can, can't can become even more oversold. As I often joke, it's often darkest right before it gets more dark. I think the example I use from a bigger picture perspective was in 2000, the NASDAQ was down 50%, and then it dropped another 55%. And, you know, that just, that, that's, without digressing too far, I was speaking once in a foreign country, and I would never question any other speaker because I don't want to be questioned. <laughs> but somebody was up there suggesting, from what I could tell, from what I could understand, it was suggesting that if a market is down 50%, just go in and sell puts. It's like, ooh, okay, that'll that'll work until it don't. I think Buffett sold a bunch of puts and he got it right. But, you know, there's Mr. Value Man, keep it simple, buy some cherry Coke, you know. <laughs> and then he sold, he was selling options. So that he does a lot of stuff that's a lot more complex and there's a lot of stuff that he does but anyway i don't want to get too far on that tangent <laughs> that's a that's probably a two drink minimum conversation and i guess if we're having beers at the bar we could talk about something better than buffett it, it, I, it just aggravates me that he gets a pass every now and then his fund loses 50 percent of its value which if you were running a hedge fund that would mean you blew up right and then he gets a pass i don't i don't i don't get it but whatever <laughs> anyway use it as a tool but tread lightly Maybe look to buy at extremes for an intraday trade or after the hook is in. And I'll show you what I mean by the hook is in. Today, for instance, we had a lap higher. And this is a spiders. I look at the futures for these things, but it's easy for me to just grab the spiders for presentation purposes. But it, and you could trade these too, obviously. Although I would probably go after like the leverage shares if you're you're gonna do this in a qualified account like an IRA or something, I'd pick up something like SPXL. So anyway, it sold off pretty hard today. And you know, here we go again. There goes the market beginning to tumble. And truth be told, I may have shorted a little bit and gotten stopped out for a small loss on that because it sure looked like we were rolling back over this morning. I may have anticipated that a little bit too much. By the way, I think that if I can learn how to not be so anxious and wait for that hook to be in and wait for the route type of days or at least a move that looks like a route move, I think I'd probably do a heck of a lot better on the intraday stuff. But anyway, today we had a nice little consolidation and then the S&P broke out from that consolidation. And it was a pretty nice run higher until right around the close, as you can see. So I'll often say the hook is in, and people are like, Dave, what do you mean by that? Well, the hook is in. It's like the market looks like it's going to do one thing, fakes out everybody out, everybody, and then, yeah, hopefully everybody else, <laughs> and then does just the opposite. So you might have kind of like the 
Of course, that was kind of like a double a double whammy. But like on that NEX trade, it kind of rallied up, probably sucked some people in, sold off hard, spit them out, looked like, hey, this thing's going to hell in the handbasket. And then it turns around and goes straight back up. So that's what I mean by the hook is in, okay? So let's say we come in and the market gets devastated and then it has some follow through to the downside and everybody in the world just wants to pile in. And then all of a sudden it begins to rally. All those new people that piled in and all those people that exited, when that thing begins to rally, they're trapped on the wrong side of the market. Was it him or Munger who called derivatives chocolate covered hand grenades? <laughs> so, I don't know, but he he does he does a lot of interesting type of I, I do I, I'm gonna get myself in trouble here, but I knew someone many, many years ago, and I don't know if he's still affiliated, so I gotta be careful, but he was with a company that was affiliated with Buffett and, and Buffett does a lot of deals that are a lot more complex than buying a little Coca-Cola, you know. I just eat cheeseburgers and Coca-Cola. <laughs> anyway. All right, let's talk about the VIX. So this is the VIX. This is the one I like to use. I think this is the original VIX. And I put the P's behind it, S&P 500 behind it in orange. And this is a 10-day simple moving average on the VIX. And my interest in the VIX was in the mid-90s when I met Larry Connors and I was doing some research for him and programming systems and such. And he was telling me that the VIX tends to revert to the mean. And so I took that literally and started messing around with moving averages. And that's where the, the CVR3 came from, which just looks for the market to get stretched away from the moving average and then look to play the reversion back to the mean. So I took that literally and said, okay, what if we made a system that if you're 10% or more away from the moving average and then you close below the open, so it looks like the VIX is coming back in, it, it stretches, that rubber band stretches so far, and then it slaps, it begins to snap back. What if you bought the market that happened and vice versa on the upside? Well, it used to work extremely well when I published Dave Landry on swing trading and I guess that was 2000. Seems like I've only published books when the market is rolling over in a bear market. Hmm. Anyway, it seemed to work really well back then and I dusted it off not that long ago and did a presentation and the signals were absolutely amazing going back about a year or so. However, there were some pandemic panics that would have really hurt you trading this type of system. And I would encourage you to not trade a, a short-term mechanical system because you're not gonna make enough money to cover the occasional big spanking, okay? Back in 2000, that was kind of like the tail end of all my programming, system programming and everything. And then me becoming more and more of a discretionary trader. So some of that mechanical stuff was still left over. And a lot of it did really work well back then. But over time, I've decided to become more and more of a discretionary trader. But I do think you can use these sort of tools to help you do trading, especially if you're going to do something on an intraday basis. And let's say the VIX is really, really, really stretched. And you think the market's getting ready to, to bounce because it stretched so much to the ups, upside. And then you see some setup like we, like I just showed where the hook is sort of in. It's like you've kind of got all those things or you kind of have all those things working for you. So anyway, 10-day simple moving average. And in the orange right here is the S&P 500. So it's the VIX with those funny looking charts. And then behind the VIX or in front of the VIX, I should say, is the S&P 500 with that orange line chart. And then down below is a formula. And last time I showed this, it showed the name. This time it showed the actual formula. Excuse me, which is pretty cool because I had a Greek salad. It's coming back. <laughs> Should call it a boomerang salad. But anyway, you can see the actual formula here. And all I'm looking for is what percentage is this 
away, the VIX away from the moving average on a closing basis. So the theory is if it's more than 10% away to the upside, then the market is oversold. And if it's less than 10% to the downside, then the market has become complacent and is due for a sell-off. And again, I wouldn't trade this mechanically, but I would kind of noodle with it a, a little bit. And if you do take a look at some of these turn downs in this oscillator, so to speak, and turn ups, those could actually be significant pivot points in the market that you want to pay attention to. So you can see it hit an extreme here, begin to turn down. And then also notice here, this would be if you're trading like a CBR three, I think that's what I called it. You could see that the close is below the, the open. So that means that the reversion of the mean, reversion to the mean has started with the VIX. But notice what the market did. Notice the market continued to drop. And this is a daily chart. So again, you wouldn't want to trade this on a daily basis because you could lose a lot of money before that reversal actually comes. And, and I'm not a big fan of reversal trading, but way back in the day, I was fascinated with short-term mechanical systems. And that probably came from working with Connors and all. And I think last I heard, he's more of a trend follower now. But uh, anyway, I digress. But you can see the market did eventually take off. Now, if you were trading, I wouldn't hold it over. I wouldn't hold something like futures overnight unless you were you had some other system where you decide you're going to hold for a long, long time. Or if you're trailing a stop intraday, like say sometimes right before the close, if I still have futures on, I'll put in a five-point trailing stop. And if the market all of a sudden rallies five or 10 points, I'll open it up to 10 points, okay? And then if it goes to 15, I'll open up to 15. You know, kind of like wherever it was at the close, I call that my bogey. So let's say we had 42.20. I think the S&P is somewhere around there. I might have my stop in at 42.15. And if it goes to 25, I might leave it there. And then I'll start trailing it on a higher and higher basis. And sometimes in the middle of the night, maybe let's say I'll get it for 30 points where if I got stopped out, it would have been the same as the close at 30 points i'll let it go and then maybe overnight i'll be pleasantly surprised sometimes i am and sometimes i'm not but sometimes i'm able to hold the position one or two days like that because i have that stop working 24 hours a day so unless you have a stop that's working 24 hours a day and then that brings up a whole another can of worms but as a general statement you don't want to be holding overnight but you can see you would have lost quite a bit or a little bit at least overnight whatever this is, a day or two before you had the mother ball reversals there. So a better thing to do would be say, okay, well, we've we've got some kind of signals working here. Let's just look for a reversal, but let's not bet the form. And then on the other side, you can see the market became very overbought, and then the VIX begins to revert back to the mean. Right here, though, if you were following like a CVR3, uh, correction on that. Right here, you can see the, the close was above the open. So that means that at least basis open to close, the VIX was beginning to revert back to the mean. And you can see you did have a little bit of a sell off that occurred from that. Now, if you look all the way over to the right, you can see we did have a little peak here. And then notice that it began to come in a little bit. And you're like, aha, look at that, the price is coming in, so this would be a good time to buy the market. Well, if you're holding overnight, you would have gotten creamed, okay? So that's why I'm just concerned, I would, I would suggest you be very careful. And then we finally got the peak on this day, it starts coming back in. Although it didn't close below the open, from here to here caused this oscillator to really begin to implode. And as I was going live here, I'm thinking like, this is something I might wanna play with quite a bit. I'm sure back in the day, I gave away all my programs in the uh, computer with trade station with the dongle on it. Anybody remember those? I think that that's long gone or in the garage somewhere. God knows where it went after two moves. But anyway, so I no longer do that programming, but I'd be willing to bet I probably mess around with this oscillator down here quite a bit. But anyway, you can see that today the VIX began, did become the, uh, did become to come 
started to come back in. That's what I'm trying to say. Started to revert back to that mean. And we had a pretty good rally, especially once the hook was in intraday. So if you come in into VIX at pretty high levels, you know you're getting closer and closer and closer to that, the mother of all intraday reversals. But like back in the pandemic, if you'd have bought on some of these daily system signals, you would have gotten absolutely cream. Now, since the pandemic, as I showed a few months ago, you would have printed money doing some of this stuff, holding it several days at a time. But I, I'm actually going to recommend you don't do that again. All right, any? I know it's I know it's a lot of eyes glaze over. I get excited with this kind of stuff because it it, it kind of gives you a little bit of an extra edge. One thing I do want to point out with the VIX is it only matters when it matters, okay? And there's a lot of times where the VIX just kind of chops around, chops around. But when it gets stretched to one of those extremes, that's when you really need to start paying attention for a possible intraday reversal in the overall market. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by Liquid Death. Anyway, so recently I started talking about route days. And a while back I talked about holy grail days and that's when you have a market that starts on one end and ends on the other. And I talked about ways where maybe you could figure out if you're getting close to Holy Grail Day or when they occur, and gave a lot of little tips of looking at how to maybe wait until the market moves 50% of its range and all. And all of that stuff is, is on YouTube, especially if you go to those quick clips. What I'm talking about here is when the market turns into a one-way route on an intraday basis. So here's a Facebook post I put out on the 21st. And the 21st was a fantastic day to trade because as you can see in the S&P 500, we had this beautiful opening gap reversal. In JDAS, we had this gap and go. And Lab D, and I think Gush was a really good trade on this day too, or Drip. It was probably Drip. But in Lab D, you can see it had a little fake out on the open and then it went higher. And on all of these days, and this was published at 11.22, so late morning my time, that's central time, I pointed out that these markets, once they started moving lower or higher for these inverse shares, they never did look back. And if you take a look at like JDUS, you can see these are two bar lows. And you can see two bar low, and then this is a two bar low here, and then it never did take out those two bar lows. So here's your low on Lab D. You don't know that's gonna be a low, but then you can see later in the day, as the day wore on, it made these higher lows and it never took out its two bar lows. So I wanna throw that out as some fodder for research, if you knew you were in that route type of situation and you just held on for dear life at a two bar low, and these two bars, by the way, these are 15 minute bars, okay? And you can read my thoughts on this if you wanna pause it later on. But the idea is once you get in these route days, you can make a hell of a lot of money but as I talked about here, you get chewed up in between. So you print money on a day like this, get chewed up, chewed up, chewed up, chewed up, chewed up. <laughs> Decide to take a day off, right? And that turns into a route day. Anyway, just want to throw that out to you guys. So if we look at today's action, again, into spiders, we had to sell off on the open after that lap. And then we broke out from that morning range. So that would be your two bar low there. And obviously, you don't know that until this bar, okay? So at 12 o'clock, now this might be on Eastern time. So at 12 o'clock, this is from stockcharts.com, you know that, okay, that's the two bar low. So at 12, on this bar here, that's your two bar low, okay? So just carry that forward here or your two bar lows throughout the day. And you can see it's pretty amazing that you never took out the two bar low until very, 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 very late in the day, okay? And I did get stopped out somewhere in here on my position. IPT was 30 points higher. I was using 30 points in the, in the, in the E-minis. 
and it got hit and then uh, it got i got taken out later in the day for about a 20 point profit on that so it was a good day it doesn't always work i would i've had like i said a while back somebody was really excited to trade emails and they were asking me a bunch of questions and i'm like look it's a really really tough market it's something that i still struggle with but if i can learn to be patient and not chase my own tail and wait for the hook to be in in a route like this i could do quite well it's the getting chewed up in between that kills you so that's what i mean when i talk about a route day it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and doesn't look back and those are an absolute godsend okay we're going to hop into the live charts i do want to touch upon that vix real quickly in a live chart well we could do that we get the stocks but we'll hop into crypto and take a look at those charts by the way if you are a gold member i would urge you to join dave landry's trend traders in facebook if you you have to at least be a gold member as i say ad nauseum i've been involved with groups forever even john bollinger once had a group of professional traders and he invited me and i was humbled and of course i accepted but that group like many 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 others turned into lord of the flies <laughs> But the great thing is our group has been fantastic so far and a lot of great traders in the group and you guys are throwing out a lot of great ideas and I make a lot of money off the group just from that and I appreciate those extra set of eyes, many extra set of eyes. Anyway, it's what, as I say every week or however often, my wife told me that's the best thing I've ever done by starting that group and it, it does help to make you feel more normal and that you're not just by yourself struggling on these trades. All right, let's shift gears. Let's take a look at crypto while I'm getting this set up. If there's any questions you have in general, let me know. We're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on crypto tonight, probably because there's just not a whole lot to show. And that's because most of crypto seems to still remain in a bear market okay getting a text from a long lost friend <laughs> if she goes there I, I, because east from mississippi i can hear him talk if she goes to a dollar i buy you a beer <laughs> it's like i told him to buy elon at 20 cents or above and i told him that uh if it goes to a, a, a penny i'll buy him two beers you know but don't buy something because it's cheap unless it's going up, okay? And as I preach each week, a 30-day EMA could be your best friend in crypto. So here's Ethereum to Bitcoin. I've been paying attention to this lately. It looks like Bitcoin Ethereum is, is beginning to weaken a little bit against Bitcoin. And Ethereum, you can see, has been a little weak as of late below the 30 EMA. So what do we do? <laughs> what do we say to crypto when it's below the 30 EMA? Not today, <laughs> unless you wanna short it. I have very few positions left. I do have some ape left in my portfolio. And I forget my old color scheme, but cyan means that I am long and have hit the initial profit target and am free rolling. So this is a free roll position. I haven't even looked at it until now. I took a peek earlier today at GMT. I have a little GMT left. And I don't know if I hit the IPT. Yeah, I did hit the IPT on this because it's a cyan. Let's take a look at Bitcoin real quick. Oh, by the way, this uh, this GMT still looks pretty good. So if you have any college funds, for your kids, just sell all that and put all your money into GMT. I'm joking. Somebody's gonna take me out of context one day. I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble. No, uh, never put more into a shit coin and you're ready to lose. S H Y T. For you people that are gonna demonetize my video. Speaking of shitty coins, uh, Bitcoin doesn't look so hot here. You can see it's below the 30 EMA, okay? Don't buy it if it's below 30 EMA. I can't say that enough. And I wish my friends wouldn't text me about Sheeb or some other shit coin that's going down and they want to buy it because they could buy 
200 million shares for $500 or $5, whatever the case may be. Anyway, let me sort these real quick by percent change. And there's really not gonna be a whole lot to look at tonight. But if you guys wanna take a look at any pairs, let me know, and then I will jump back in. I'll jump into stocks. But you can see even sorted by the strongest pairs, a lot of these are still below the 30 EMA and a lot of these are still in downtrends. Now, a while back, all you had to do was buy the strongest pairs. And as I've said quite a bit, I remember on Thanksgiving day, like I said, I was frying turkeys, drinking beer, and I was coming in here to trade and I hit seven IPTs in these things. And boy, that was a dream. It's like, okay, it's gonna be like this for the rest of my life. And unfortunately, as you'll probably learn if you haven't been trading for more than a week, is that that permanent income hypothesis doesn't happen all that often in trading, okay? Good things come to an end quickly. The good news is crypto market changes quickly. This one's kind of interesting. I don't know, I've traded it before. I don't know how much volume it has now, but if you were to buy something on a relative strength basis, buy something like this, banging out new highs, nice Landry light to the upside. And as a general statement, it tends to trade somewhat cleanly. So that's a pretty good looking one there. That's Kava, whatever that is. You know what they do? I have no idea. <laughs> anyway, so most of these not doing so hot in here. A couple of them catching my eye here and there, but not a whole lot. And by the way, somebody was saying that, was talking earlier about what do you do if you find a setup you like? And he was talking about stocks. What do you do if you find a setup you like and the overall market's not doing so hot? Well, if you can't stand it, then by all means, take it. I'm always setup driven. And, and you'll notice in the trading service, the market might be a little funky, but I see a setup I really like, especially a setup that could trade contra to the overall market, such as energy stock. And energies happen to also be trending. So if the sector's trending, even though the market's headed lower and you really like the setup, then by all means, take it. But you might want to err on the side of sitting on your hands. In other words, not putting in, not putting capital in the harm's way because the chances of your success are a lot, lot less. This looks kind of interesting. You can see it's in a nice uptrend meter, M-E-T-E-R, whatever the hell it is. I mean, it's all stupid, right? <laughs> so I never want to come across as like, I, crypto's going to change the world. It, it might, I don't know. It, it, it can, I don't know. I am kind of bullish on Bitcoin longer term, and I do have a little tiny bit hodled, and that's mostly through uh, derivatives, so don't come try to $5 wrench me. Okay, let's hop into stocks real quick, and then I want to take a second to just kind of touch upon that VIX stuff before we hop into the overall market and such. And if you want to start asking questions about, and if you want to throw up some individual stock picks, feel free to do so now. So it was a CBOE on that website. So just real quick, you can see that the oscillator came back in, okay? And then notice that the market, as soon as the oscillator came in, okay, that was the peak. Day one starts coming in, day two. So the long side last couple of days, if you're looking at the little orange line above on the P's, the market ended higher, obviously, on those days. Now let's take a look down here just for S and G's. You can see we're really stretched here, which means the market's due to sell off. But look, it really didn't sell off and it went a long ways higher. Okay. It had you had a few days where, you know, maybe on this day here. On an intraday basis, that might have been a, a profitable trade, but holding overnight short, you would have to be super duper careful and you would get your butt handed to you. Now, eventually it did sell off, but you can't sit around and hold through that big of a drawdown if you're a an intraday trader. So let's look at back here real quick. So this looked like an extreme here, okay? And the market did sell off a little bit, but then it got more extreme, okay? And then it sold off a little for a couple of days. And then you had the big sell off a few days later. So just be super careful if you're using something a little bit more complex like this, because if you're not careful, 
you could get it to a lot, a lot of trouble. So let's see what's happening. Where, where would the buy be here? Yeah, so the buy would have been a couple of days late on that, but then eventually it did work out. So make sure you're doing something on an intraday basis and you're being super duper careful with that. So if you guys figure out route days or just let me know if one's happening just in case I'm off doing something else. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And if you have any stock picks, just let me know. I'll be happy to look at those too. Oh, by the way, one thing that I forgot to mention, but if you go in on my website on Friday, I'll post the show. We did get a repeat TFM 10% sell signal and the piece. We had a buy a couple of weeks earlier, and but the buy was like had a tiny, tiny bit of Landry light and the market had already come back in and the designer's intent on that was to buy on strength, not on weakness. So I didn't see that as a signal that should be taken, so to speak, okay? Instead, I, I felt like you needed to focus on the short side of the market, continue to focus on the short side of the market or continue to sit on your, sit on your hands as the methodology suggests as opposed to buying that, even though technically it was a signal. And when I get around to it, I will, update the spreadsheet and put that trade in even though it's something that i wouldn't take on that buy signal which probably happened when it was run up here after it came back in unfortunately anyway so we do have a, a buy a sell signal that was a few weeks ago in the s p 500 it might have been last friday or friday before i forget i think it was last friday anyway i'll have that Trading simplified show up soon. Bonds, you can see, remain in a pretty serious downtrend. They 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 bounced off their lows, rolled over a little bit in here, but obviously it looked like they are on their way down. Bonds down, right? Inverse relationship to rates means rates up. Look at this dollar hanging in there. Thank goodness. They just printed what? I forget the exact numbers. 80% of all the dollars in circulation were printed in the last year and a half. It's like Every time I go to look it up, I'm like, I don't want to know, but I think one of you guys confirmed that in the group. Oh, by the way, my big concern, as I've been saying quite a bit in the piece, was that we'd rally just enough to make everybody feel good about the markets. And I'm a man on the street, and right around here, people will say, Dave, looks like it's coming back. I'm like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> do, you, do you watch the market in a minute? You know, it's like... I begged these people to watch the market in a minute. I did a presentation last summer on market timing while the market was at brand new high by these people, I mean, friends, family. <laughs> but you know, they're gonna call me, they're gonna call me when if, I, I just almost said when, hopefully it's not a Freudian slip, but when or if, I said it again. <laughs> it's kind of like the Knights of St. Nee, E. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> when, was it it they couldn't uh, tolerate? We, I watched it the other night, not that long ago. I should remember this. But anyway, if it goes down about 30% from where we are now, then my phone's going to ring and they're going to be in a panic. And I'm going to be like, what do I do now? The bombs already blowed up. You know, where were you 30% ago, 40% ago, 50% ago? Anyway, my big concern, as I said, was that we rallied just enough to get everybody excited and roll back over. And that's exactly what happened. Okay. Not that I'm always right, but you have to play out these scenarios in your mind. You have to think about the psychology of the players, okay? So everybody feels pretty good here, and then all of a sudden it spits them right back out. As I preach, and I got this from Linda Rasky, the market will do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner, and a corollary to that would be that the market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people. And trust me, as a trader, I get frustrated daily and think the market is doing what it has to do. <laughs> I told Linda once, I said, Linda, I stopped listening to you because every time I listen to you, I pick up so much and I start sounding like you. Uh, anyway, uh, NASDAQ had a little bit of a bounce today, better than a poke in the eye, 3%. It's amazing. That doesn't look like a 3% day. 3% day it used to look like that, right? Anyway. You can see it rolled over just like the peas that actually led the markets 
or led to fees lower. We were just at these one year plus lows a couple of days ago, or yesterday, I should say. So if I would be concerned if we come down here and take out these lows, again, I think I said earlier, I'm seeing some people talking about bottom fishing. I would not do that unless it's on an intraday basis, okay? So right now we're still probably pretty oversold and you see some sort of intraday reversal, you wanna get in for the afternoon, looks like things are going really well, it looks like a route day. Maybe the VIX has contributed to your analysis, then by all means, knock yourself out. Energies, come back, they came back with a vengeance. I'm glad to see this gap in here close. Uh, forest for the trees, take a look at a weekly. You can see we kind of got a TK on the weekly. That looks pretty darn good still. So I was a little concerned about the energies a couple of days ago. Longer term was still bullish. Today's action makes me feel a lot better. But hey, check back often. Metals and mining, a little bit different story. I'm not fantastic with the new TC. Nope, it's not there. Let's try bow tie too. Okay, there's the bow tie. So what I've been telling my peeps in the trading service is that we could bow tie soon. And we're really close to bow tying to the downside. Okay, but it is a first thrust so far. Now, if we have the mother of all rallies here, I wouldn't, it would negate the signal, but we do have to pay attention to what's happening. I, I'm not, I'm a little hesitant to become a, to go and short them right now, but eventually I think I might have to put on some metals and mining shorts. But let's just see how this shakes out. I do have a couple on my watch list. I think there's one or two in the lander list tonight. If you want to get a head start on those, they're pioneer type setups, meaning that it's the first rollover. And like the American pioneers, you're either going to get the gold or the arrow by trading such patterns. We're still on ARLP and coal. I guess that's more of an energy. And this one has worked out really, really nice. And I think I talked about this one in last week's stock chart show. And we got in back here, and which is great on the upside, but it can be a little scary when you have a down day or two or three or four like we just had. But we, I think the original trade was 2,000 shares back here on a 100K account. It's only $5 a share, right? Four something, whatever. But now that it's 18 and you've got 1,000 shares still on because you flip out half of those, half of those shares, so it's 2,000 down to 1,000. And I'm pretty sure it was 2,000 and 1,000. I know I have multiple accounts with 1,000 shares in them, and I think I was trading them based on service. But anyway, long story endless. So far, so good, but a one-point move was a thousand-point swing, obviously. And also on this one, I didn't realize until I was doing a presentation last week for stock charts, we picked up a lot of dividends along the way over the last year and a half. I was like, holy moly, there was a lot of dividends that were paid out. I didn't even notice, which I think is really, really, really cool. Not that I didn't notice, but the dividends. Anyway, in general, as you go through these sectors you can see as the banks take it out of the bottom of this range in here a little bit of a bounce today if these begin to drop in earnest this is going to be a big old mound of overhead resistance to get to my version of technical analysis even though you looked at that vix and you might think it's mumbo jumbo is really quite simple 90 percent of what i do is like okay look at this chart this thing drops much further and then tries to rally back anybody who bought in this range is going to be looking to get out at break even Financials looking pretty ugly in here. Touched multi-year lows or one-year plus lows at least yesterday. A little bit of a rally today, but keep an eye on these recent lows in here. If they could take it out, it could get pretty ugly. Drugs made all-time highs, but then rolled right back over. So I would be careful there. They're kind of back into the, the soup, so to speak. Biotechnology sold off pretty hard today, tagged some new lows, but then had the mother of all rallies up. I don't want to brag, but I did make a little bit in Lab D, and then the hook was in, and I made a little bit in Lab U. So this was kind of a kind of a dream day. I wouldn't say a dream day, but it wasn't a bad day. Okay, here's an intraday chart. You could see that. Look how beautiful this is. Okay, let's see one, two. Yeah, look, you didn't get a two bar high until right there. So that was a pretty nice move to the downside. And then look at the upside, okay? Two bar low, 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 
two bar low, two bar low, two bar low, and then two bar low, and then the stop would have been actually right here. Okay. Not that I suggest you run out and trade two bar lows and two bar highs, but on a V day like this, we have a route down and a route up, it could actually work out. So be careful with that. But if you are successful with it, let me know. The problem is getting chewed up in between. You know, for the week, I'm probably hadn't made a whole lot of money. It's kind of like, why didn't I just start trading today for the week? You know, <laughs> how, do, how do I how do I reach that point? You know, where I'm only trading on these fantastic days. And that's the day trading stuff. I have it, the intraday stuff. I haven't I haven't been doing that like I'm doing now for 30 years. With the core methodology, life's a lot easier. And a lot of times I just look at the trading service. It's like, oh, I've got all these profits in this stock. I should take them. What does the trading service say to do? It says, trade your stop higher, leave your stop where it is. So I just have to leave it where it is. And sometimes it works out really nicely, and sometimes it doesn't. We got stopped out of one today. SES. So sometimes we do be nailing these things. All right, semiconductors. By if you've been around for a while, you know I like to look at semiconductors as a bellwether, if that's the right word, or as I said, I think last week, more of a harbinger of market conditions. And if the semis are weak, I think in general the S&P 500 is going to have a hard time rallying. So maybe next week I'll do a little research, or tomorrow where I'll look at the semis versus the S&P 500, and maybe on your own, you might want to do that. You can do a ratio chart on stockcharts.com. You just put a colon between the two things you want to look at, and that could be kind of uh, fun to play with. I know you want to party with me. <laughs> anyway, let's take a look at the semis. You can see they did the rollover first, and then the NASDAQ sort of followed, and that's that's a testament to why I like to watch the semis, and you should too. I think I just paid for your webinar right there. Keep an eye on those semis. So today we had a really, really nice rally, as you know, in the semis. I wouldn't rush out and buy the semis just because we rallied. Like anything, we take out the recent low in here. It could get ugly pretty fast. And finally, uh, the utilities still look pretty good in here, although there's nothing here that excites me on individual stock bases. These stocks tend to be a little bit lower in HV, for instance, the semiconductors, you can see HV is 41 for the 50 day historical volatility. You take a look at the utilities, they have uh, HV of 16. The SP 500, for reference, has an HV of 23. The way I feel about markets is if you want to beat the market, you need to be in stocks that are more volatile than the overall market. All right and sectors too. Any questions on anything? Any individual stock picks? I know we go back and forth all day in Facebook, so everybody here, I think we've been talking about stocks all day. All right, here we go. HCC first thrust for George George. Hey, hello, George. Warrior met coal. I always call that hot, wet coal for some reason. Yeah, it looks okay. Um, I'm not ready to go after the energies just yet, but that would be a pioneer setup. And how did I make that bow tie work earlier? I used to be able to just hit a key. I think it's BT2. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. So it is sort of making a bow tie in here. It's also kind of a first thrust. I would say that's a good that's a good eye, George. I just I'm just not ready to rush out and short coal and energy related stocks just yet. I mean, you know, obviously you should be long. Are you still long ARLP with the service? Or did you come in after that one triggered, George? See, that's the problem I have like with the service. It's like I have a stock that's just this huge winner. Okay, he came in after. So you're probably experiencing the same thing. Got a stock that's a huge winner and it's it's ridiculous. Like, and, and knock on wood, you know, uh, come in. Uh, but not good wood, it's like, I forget how many points, but it's like uh, 13 points on a thousand shares, plus another thousand, plus the uh, all the dividends and all, it's like $13,000 and it's just one stock, maybe 15, 16 by the time you add everything up. But I was thinking the other day, like we like yesterday, for instance, we had a two point, two and a half point jump or whatever. So that's $2,500 on a 100K account, that's two and a half percent. 
But like today, we had a stinker that got stopped out. So somebody new to service like this service sucks. But the ultimately, if you have these fifteen and twenty thousand dollar winners in there, which which is the ultimate goal through the swing to intermediate term and hopefully longer trading over time, you will do well. Most people don't stick around long enough to reap the benefit, the fruits of my labor. What happens is as soon as things get dicey, they go off to chase rainbows. And I've seen people chase rainbows for 20 years. In fact, I was I I wake up every morning and write, and some of this stuff will eventually find its way to the website or to a book or a presentation, whatever. I've got a book in my head. And I've just been writing every day and writing and writing every morning. But that's one thing I wrote about this morning is somebody contacted me for 20 years. And I was beginning to think that they were mentally challenged. I, I guess I can't say that what I really thought they were because that would, it's no longer politically correct. <laughs> Not that it ever was. And then I was like, you know, you just need to go in and reread the first book instead of emailing me six times a day. And, you know, here I am, my wrists are killing me from carpal tunnel, like a cubital tunnel. I had one surgery, didn't work. And it's like, it's just, I got braces. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just, it's horrible. And he's like, oh, I've been meaning to get that. You've been meaning to get the book for 20 years? And, you know, I give the books away now. So it's not like I'm trying to sell you a book. And and I probably would have made $6 on that book or $5 if that much. I mean, you know, it's no big deal. But the point is, number one, he didn't have any skin in the game. Okay. But the main point is he wasn't willing to invest a little time in himself and learn. And then when I backed off on answering every single email from him, because I realized that he didn't care. He didn't care to try. He later emails me about some some guru he's chasing now. And I'm like, you know, I hope he bugs the shit out of that guy for 20 years. You know, he just he just wasn't ready. And, and it's a stupid thing to say. But when a student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I have people come to me. And they do. They do. OK. They make a little lose a little whatever. They go off to chase rainbows. And then they come back. And I've said this a thousand times, five years, 10 years, 15 years, sometimes 20 years later and say, Dave, I get it. There's no holy grail. The simple stuff can work, not all the time, but as George just said, over time, I'm with you. Let's let's give it a shot. S V S W V L for John. S W V L. Ooh, look at that. That's kind of crazy, huh? That is actually a buy at B, right? What's the volume? 28 million. Holy crap. That's interesting. That's just a little crazy, though. I mean, it went from Went from 10 down to four. John's our resident IPO guru. Yeah, this might be worth a shot. Maybe trade in a small way. I mean, this thing is going to, good Lord. It went from six, to, it, it went up 100% at one point today, and it closed up 50%. But yeah, this technically, yeah, it's a buy at B. This is a little bit extreme. I didn't think about a stock looking like this when I came out with the buy at B. But yeah, by all means, that is a buy at B. Just uh, be ready for a wild ride. Make sure you have a stop in place on that. And better yet, or in addition to that, I should say, trade fewer shares and use a wider stop. One thing I was thinking about today is, at least on the intraday stuff, but some of this actually applies to, to longer term trading too. And that's one that's, well, not to, let me back up one one step further. One thing I was thinking about is how much time am I wasting on the intraday stuff and how much can I learn about trading in the process? Well, obviously, if I could pick up a little money here and there, like the ogres and all, and still have a life, then it's worthwhile. But the other thing I was thinking about is how much can I learn from a psychological standpoint and from a market standpoint by doing some of this intraday stuff. And I know years ago, it's like somebody didn't believe me. I told him, Ruth, Teresa, like, no, I'm doing a little intraday trading. You know, <laughs> I try to stop sort short of calling it day trading. But one thing I thought about today is I bet I would be a lot more accurate and probably make more money if I cut my size in half and doubled my stops, okay? Cut my size in half and doubled my stop. So instead of 500, instead of 1,000 shares, maybe 500 shares, and then use a bigger stop to where the risk is the same. And as I've said before, I've helped a lot of people who were not successful as traders and really thought they had a problem by just saying, 
loosen your stops a little bit. And in doing that, they were able to ride out some of these corrections. So yes, curious what you thought about it, be crazy. <laughs> curious what you thought it'd be crazy. It is crazy, it's cray cray. But yeah, I might uh, I might dip a toe in, but um, get ready to have it chopped off. But look at the volume on this thing, 28 million, whew. That's gonna be nuts. But yeah, I think I think I might, I'll see how this trades tomorrow. I'll see how it looks like it's gonna close. If it closes this level or higher, or maybe even intraday, I might, I'm talking to S&G. I, I do not bet the form on this thing, but technically it is a buy at D pattern and I might have to, I might have to nibble at it. So institutional interest, good point. Yeah, I don't know. And see, that's something I've, I've been trying to wrap my head around over the last couple years, the volume has gone nuts on some of this stuff. I got one in a laundry list that has like 30 million or 20 something million on average, and it's got a HV of like 180 or 170. It's just like crazy volatile and crazy volume. And that's just a new thing to me. But, you know, maybe if you get on the right side of something like this, and again, it's dangerous, but let's take a look at it on an intraday basis. Okay. So most of this move was in these first three bars. If you didn't catch that, you were hurting pop. So, I mean, how do you know that this is going to follow through from there? So that would have been tough. Let's see what it looks like on other days. Yeah, it just it's, it's like one and done on these moves. So if you were to try to go in for an intraday trade, get in and hold on for dear life <laughs> but have a have an uncle point in mind and ideally what you want to do if you were able to catch like a wide range bar in this thing flip out half as soon as possible get that stop to break even and if it shoots up 100 percent or whatever peel off some more okay but yeah very interesting very interesting that's one funny story dave i'm trying to remember the expression you imitated in a funny voice a long time ago from one of your subscribers. But Dave, what about the what about the situation in Nigeria? I think that was it. The situation in Nigeria was I was speaking at Traders Expo in New York, and I showed the portfolio that had a couple of shorts in it, and they were all companies. And then I was teaching them how to pick stocks and said, Okay, all stocks are headed lower. Here's a setup, bow tie, rolling over. Write this one down. I will be trading this one on Monday. Take a look at it. And I did that on a few of them, and this guy just blurted out. He sounded like Henry, Henry Kissinger. What about the situation in Nigeria? I'm like, what about the situation in Nigeria? And I was being, <laughs> what word am I saying? Um, not hypothetical, but uh, rhetorical, I guess. <laughs> like. I really don't care about it. And he proceeds to tell me the situation in Nigeria. And it's like, I, you know, hopefully this guy was able to get over that. But I don't know. I mean, you, you confuse the issue with facts, you get in a lot of trouble. All right. So, yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be fun tomorrow. Let's, uh, oh man, <laughs> I'm getting nervous just thinking about it right now. <laughs> oh, crap. Oh, geez. I wonder if it's still active in after hours. I'm going to check after the show. I might buy 100 shares just to have it on my radar. So when I wake up tomorrow, I remember to uh, deal with it. But, oh, geez. Don't bet the forum. Please, 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 please. You didn't see much in after hours? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll check it out as soon as uh, I wrap it up. I think the markets, it's hard to buy anything at this time of night anyway. And, and it, I don't think, I've, I don't ever remember entering trades this late. All right, anything else? Going once, going twice. Well, obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, DaveLander.com slash contact. And obviously, if you're in a Facebook group, just bring it up there and we'll all noodle with it a lot. Boy, we've been active lately. It's been uh, it's been fun. I know you want to party with us. Huh? <laughs> Everybody have a great weekend. We will talk between now and then. It made a trend be with you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, guys. You're welcome. <laughs>